we may start with introversion, but as soon as people get over, oh, that's how my brain works, the, the actual language of introversion goes away. And mm -hmm. what we're looking for is finding your true leadership. So like any coaching anyone, it's finding what's true for you and how do you pursue that? And so watching someone kind of accept themselves for who they are and their preferences to then finding that internal confidence to then taking action and recognizing, oh, I am in an extroverted world, so I do need to change my behaviors. Um, and so, but it's not changing who I am. Hi, I'm Roger Kastner, and welcome to the What Do You Know To Be True podcast. In these conversations, I talk with ordinary people about their extraordinary skill, their superhero power, and the meaningful impact it has on others. The goal is not to try to emulate or hack our way to a new talent. Instead, the intention is to learn more about their experience with their superhero power so that maybe we can learn something more about the special talent in each of us which then allows us to connect more deeply with our own purpose. This conversation is with Jennifer Marcoux and how she coaches others to lead with quiet confidence. Like many people I've spoken with about their superhero powers, their journey to making an impact with others started with their personal relationship with that superhero power and developing it so that they could apply it for themselves to overcome a challenge they experienced. And Jennifer's story is no different. As a female leader in a male-dominated industry, she found that her natural style of working and her gender was not well represented in her peer group and definitely not in the ranks above hers. She was faced with a challenge to either put on a mask and lead inauthentically or learn how to lead in a way that was authentic to her own style and, as she says, with how her own brain works. In this conversation, Jennifer shares how she learned to work with and how to lead others in ways that played to the strengths of her introversion. She also shares how she now coaches other leaders to live into their natural style and how to use their introversion as an advantage and not something to cover. Her message is a great one for the introverts to embrace and to think of introversion as nothing more than a style. It's also a powerful message for extroverts to be aware of, so we can be better aware of what we can do differently to be more inclusive and be better partners and co-creators with everyone in the room, not just the ones who are the first to speak or speak the loudest, but instead for those whose voices are equally valuable, equally important, equally worthy of being heard and being fully represented in the conversation. If you're ready, let's dive in. Good morning, Jennifer. Welcome to the pod. It's good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm really excited to learn more about your superhero power of leading with quiet confidence and the impact it has on others. But first, I think it would be important to learn how you got to this place from your, your working at, um, at Microsoft to becoming a coach to being very targeted in who you work with and why. So tell us, tell us how you got to where you're at. So it was back in 2016. Uh, I was at Microsoft, as you said, um, and I had a person on my team who took a coaching class with Seattle Coach. And uh, she came back from that class, it was quite extensive, several months, um, and the feedback from her team was just incredible, like uh, that she is, her, her name is Mosey, uh, Rosie Mastrandrea, uh, she's an incredible coach and a leader, and these were uh, f feedbacks I had not heard from her team before. And so I said, wow, this coaching thing is pretty amazing um, in helping to develop and grow people, and that's something I've always been passionate about. So I said, hmm, I got to take this training. So I took the training, um, it was amazing, and I did not want to be a coach at the time. I just love developing and growing people and, and continue to do that in a leadership role. But in 2000, actually the same year, 2016, I took a class where I had to write down five things that I could be doing uh, five years from now. 
And so one was obviously doing what I was doing, but at a higher level or doing it at another company. And one interesting thing I wrote down, uh, again, this was 2016, was have my own coaching and leadership development business, but not do any business development, which is ridiculous. How can you have your own business without doing sales or business development? So I was like, scratch that off. It it makes no sense. I can't do that. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, I'm an introvert. So the idea of doing sales is just like, oh my God, that'd be the worst thing in the world. So I didn't really think about it until about 2019. Um, I had done, I love training and development. I had done a training where we had identified our values. Have you done that before? Yeah. So I had done, I don't know, five or six times and I was kind of rolled my eyes because I said, they never change. They're always the same. And that year they had changed Mm. and two things were different. One was um, on my top five values. One uh, was achievement and respect were no longer in my top five values. And at first I said, oh my gosh, was I lying to myself? And I realized, no, actually uh, that is not important to me anymore. And it was replaced by development and awe. And here I am in the corporate world, and I say, how does awe fit into anything (laughs) I do in my work? Um, And then subsequently, my uh, stepfather passed away that year, and it made me realize life is short. And I kind of went back to that, what could I do in five years? Um, So this is now four years later. And I said, wow, I really, really want to coach people. And so made the decision uh, end of 2019. So notice the dates. Mm-hmm. March 13th of 2020 was my last day at Microsoft. March 16th was my first day of my coaching business. And uh, it was also the week that our governor closed down the state for COVID. Um, and it was an amazing time to start a coaching business. So going back to that thought around, hey, I don't want to do business development, Um I would just reach out to people on LinkedIn and say, how are you doing? You know, how's this COVID thing happening? You know, what are you doing? And how's your family? And I would tell them what I was doing, but I would never ask the question um, or state the question, do you need a coach? Do you know someone who needs a coach? And in the first like three minutes of our last three minutes of the call, they would usually say, I think I need a coach. And so I was like, I'm a coach. So that uh, I think you and I had talked about this. That is like a business development call, but it's actually doing it in my way. Mm-hmm. Right. Which was not this salesy pressurized you know, conversation it was a conversation. Um, and that's how I started my business. And then very quickly, I realized I just loved coaching uh, introverted women, um, and particularly who are in either tech or STEM or some sort of more male dominated or perhaps extroverted um, organizations, uh, where these are the, the people who are not raising their hands to get support. Um, they're at a mid level, so they're not automatically getting uh, support, you know, that uh, maybe senior leaders do get. Um, and uh, so I realized that this is something I'm passionate. I was uh, one of those women as well, still am, uh, at least uh, an introverted woman, and realized I could really help them for, you know, through coaching itself, let alone my own experiences. You know, your passion, your capabilities, um, the the thing that makes the world a better place all come through in that story. So I I, I love to see that. And um, yes, we, we we know each other off off outside of the podcast. We're we're members of the same book club, and that's what brought us together, which I'm so grateful for. And when uh, in in those times where I get to hear you talk about the work that you do, that passion comes through. It's super strong. Uh, I do have a question about the story that you tell and the you know, the people you like to work with are, you know, female technology leaders who are introverts. You're also a female leader who's an introvert. Was there someone that helped inspire you the way you're helping and inspiring others? I've had lots of uh, great leaders, mentors, kind of mentoring moments. I've, I don't feel like I've had a mentor per se, uh, but I've had lots of people who provide support at kind of opportune times. I think um, being an introvert, I have mostly learned on my own um, without asking for help uh, because that's mm. something I've always been uncomfortable with. 
And it's through observation, what I want to be like and what I don't want to be like. Um, and so that's been an interesting um, process of, you know, recognizing throughout my um, kind of career, uh, there are certain leaders like um, Al Kelly, who actually is, I think he's the CEO now of Visa, um, who used to memorize, he said he would memorize people's names um, so that when he had an organization of thousands of people, he would remember their names. And that was, to me, such a great insight of connection. Um, so here was someone who had this artificial process to connect to people, but it was incredibly powerful because you're like, how can Al Kelly remember who I am and that, you know, my husband plays golf or I have three kids or what have you. Um, and so I think there have been moments I've had uh, actually a super extroverted boss um, who I learned from um, that we had such different skill sets. We would walk out of the same meeting and it felt like we went to two different meetings because she <laughs> would take away something different. And I would say, hey, Joe didn't really like that idea. And Jane is all on board with us. But because of her extroversion and she was the one speaking the meeting, driving a lot of the change, she wasn't observing what was happening. So we actually were a great compliment. Mm. And what I learned from her was, you know, she would know that I was not going to speak up and she would make space for me. So that is where I learned kind of the partnership. It's not just about me and who I am and what actions I take, but it was about um, finding a partner who's able to open the way to allow me to speak in that case. You're touching on something I think is really important in that um, we've, there's been a few episodes here on, on this series where we talk about the stories we tell ourselves and how to mm -hmm. yeah, rewrite those stories. Um, but there's also the stories we tell ourselves about certain situations. Um, do you find that introverts and extroverts, and, and, and it's the introversion, extroversion that shapes the story we tell about a, a, an experience we've had? Mm, interesting. Um, so when I talk about introverts and extroverts, it sounds like it's very binary. You're either an introvert or you're an extrovert. <laughs> we all know there's a whole scale and there are different types of introversion and extroversion. Um, in fact, I think the official um, test you can take is Hexaco or the Big Five test, and there are uh, different uh, types of introversion. So I'm going to use introversion as a general general term, but know that uh, when I talk about that, it is uh, something that there's a whole array, a whole spectrum of introversion. Introverts and extroverts uh, can see things in a very different world, a uh, different way. Um, I think introverts just by nature is much more reflective inside. So there's a lot of analytical thinking going on inside of an introvert, whereas an extrovert is much more outward focused. Um, and there's, there's not a good or bad to this, it's just different. Um, and so the idea of what an introvert will see is very different. They're going to be observing body language. Um, an extrovert is going to be you know, focused on getting what they want to say out. And so in many cases, an introvert um, finally figures out what they want to say, but the meeting is already over, or an extrovert has already stated what they want to state. And so it comes off as an introvert is not participating, and an extrovert is highly participating, when in fact, they're both using different strengths, um, just in different ways. Um, I always laugh that part of the challenge of an introvert is to, um, to speak up. Why is that a problem? Because introverts hate to interrupt. And uh, an introvert, I always say, the extroverts have no idea how many times people have been interrupted or how many times they've been interrupted or they've interrupted others. An introvert knows how many times they were interrupted or other people were interrupted. And so it's just, just this different observation, different expectation, different value uh, that comes out that then impacts people's behavior. So absolutely people get a different view of what's happening in a meeting um, or a situation because of that more reflective um, observational strength versus an extrovert um, who is extroverting and, and uh, stating their perspective and sharing that, which is an incredible strength. So I love how you're calling these strengths um, because I'm not sure if everyone sees it the same way. 
Um, I think an extrovert sees extroversion as a strength and introversion as potentially a weakness. Do introverts, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you to speak for all introverts. Um, <laughs> I know that's unfair, but do intro, introverts also see introversion as a strength or do they ha have a different outlook on it? It's interesting. Uh... I, as I mentioned, coach introverts. And so usually in the beginning of a coaching session, I'll ask if someone is more introverted uh, versus extroverted. And of course, the immediate reaction of a person who I know is an introvert will say, oh, I'm, I, I have friends. I like to go to parties. I like to have fun. And so it is this feeling, especially in American society and probably Western society in general, that in extroversion is more preferred than introversion. Uh, there are lots of reasons for that, like in school, raise your hand, speak out, uh, speak up front, uh, do presentations in the work, um, make sure you're, you know, speaking your opinion, lead out in front is feedback I constantly got. Um, but realizing that actually once you realize, oh, uh, about half the world is an introvert, so it's not an abnormal thing, um, and that an introvert um, or introvert preference um, does have a lot of strengths that extroverts don't have um, can be very powerful. And so I actually share uh, with my clients the differences between an introverted and an extroverted brain. And so, by the way, I haven't even defined what introversion is. To me, there are lots of, you know, uh, psychology tests that you can um, uh, test your assessment on extrovert versus introversion. But for me, I use what Susan Cain, uh, from, who wrote Quiet, uses, which is where you get your energy. So I say, if you go to a party, you had a great time, you come home, what do you want to do? Do you want to spend some time with yourself to re-energize? Or do you want to go to the next party to, re to energize? And so an introvert will be usually saying, I just want to read a book or I want to go to sleep or I want to go on a walk by myself. Um, that does not mean they don't like to go to parties. So I think there is this almost embarrassment. I don't want to admit I'm an introvert. But once I share, their brains are different. So um, I'm not a brain scientist, so don't, uh, don't look up the scientific uh, background on, on uh, what I'm about to say, but I've learned a lot from other scientists around uh, the introverted versus extroverted brain. Again, this is going to be binary, but it is not at all. Our brains are exactly the same in terms of uh, the type of neurotransmitters and the processes, but there are just certain strengths. The strength of the extroverted brain is that there are more dopamine receptors. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter, it's the reward uh, transmitter or the reward uh, yeah, neuro neurotransmitter. And uh, so an extrovert gets a reward by speaking or getting a like on social media or being you know, in a party. Whereas an introvert um, gets their hit is really on the acetylcholine uh, neurotransmitter, which is much more slower moving. It's not about a reward system, but uh, the brain actually uh, takes the stimulus of whatever information is, goes to the prefrontal cortex, which is where the thinking happens, the analysis happens, and then goes to the action. So that is why an introvert um, you know, finally figures out what they want to say, but the meeting's over because they had to think about it first. Whereas an extrovert doesn't take that extra step, they actually think and speak at the same time and is able to get their points out in the meeting. So again, not good or bad, it's just different. And once you share that with an introvert, oh, I'm normal, it's okay <laughs> that, that it, because the society is and their boss and their teacher has always told them, speak up, speak up, speak up. Once you understand that that's just a, there's a biological process happening, you can't change that, but what you can change is behaviors to help you in that type of environment. Thank you for, for walking us through that and giving us the, the not only the, a working definition between introversion and extroversion, but then talking to the strength and the, the chemical, the biological um, difference between the two. And, you know, I'm, I'm, this is a confession. I have sometimes been that extrovert um, who has, uh, you, you know, been a dopamine junkie and, and blurted, <laughs> blurted something out in a meeting as a way of externally processing things and of later to realize the fault in what I said in that 
you know, it, you know it, I, I never thought of it as a rush to get that dopamine hit, but I'm sure it's there. But in that, um, you know, contributing, engaging in the meeting, trying to contribute to something, and there's that, you know, there's that that excitement of being in that discussion and contributing, and you know, really, it's probably sucking up the air for other people to be able to, de- you know, have more deep thinking about, you know, how you know, they're, how they would process that information and how they would contribute. And, you know, um, if, since I'm in the confession booth, um, you know, (laughs) being male, be a consultant, being a facilitator, like there's a lot of like work things that have pushed me to uh, lean into that extroversion. And I, I've, I learned this a couple of years ago that a lot of the activities we do within our group methods are really aligned to extroversion mm-hmm. and not aligned to get, as you say, half the people in the room to participate. Um, and that's that's been something once I once I became aware of that, started thinking of okay, how do we how do we give our introverts the opportunity to read something in advance to be begin that processing process, uh, so they feel okay to be able to contribute in that space and the extroverts like me in the room aren't sucking all the air out of out of the space and and not allowing them to do so so little activities like you know if if we're asking people to do a sticky note activity the first question the first the first thing we do is give people five minutes to write their sticky notes by themselves and there's no talking um i have found that to be helpful the pre-read in advance um Mm -hmm to give people opportunity to, to process in advance. And the introverts absolutely do the, do the pre-reading. Uh-huh. The, ex, the extroverts <laughs> don't at their peril. Um, and, and so I, I think there's little ways that can help bring everyone to the conversation. Do you have any tips or tricks or things that you do or would recommend someone, you know, to someone who might be um, relying too much on extroversion <laughs> or playing on that in the room? So I want to be careful that we don't demonize either behavior, right? So the extroversion, that's just your brain. That's how your brain works. That's how your brain works best. And I always tell leaders, if you want to get the most out of an extrovert, ask them the question right now. If you want to get the most out out of an introvert, ask them a question today and have them give you an answer tomorrow. And Mm. so just being aware of the differences and personally your own preferences, where you're going to do your best work is super important. So as you know, in organizational development or learning development, different styles, people sometimes like to act as they learn, sometimes like to read ahead, sometimes, uh, you know, want to learn from someone else or ask questions about it. So just appreciating those differences, super important. Um, I think for an introvert learning one, that's just my preference of what my brain is going to do. What do I need to do to be able to be successful in a world where the meeting is going to happen and a decision is going to be made? And if my voice is not heard, then that's going to be a detriment to the organization or the decision. And so connecting to what you're accountable for. It's not a preference and, oh, I don't like speaking up. It's actually, I'm hurting the organization. I'm hurting the team if I'm not speaking my opinion because it feels like, um, you know, either someone has said it or people must be thinking about that, but it's not important or however I'm downplaying my perspective. And so connecting to your purpose is one way for an introvert to overcome that feeling of, oh, I don't really need to say anything, or it's uncomfortable. Um, so to your point on you know, both, uh, again, binary, but it's not binary, both sides of introversion and extroversion, an extrovert, just as you're saying, needs to be aware, oh, maybe I'm speaking too much. Maybe I need to step back. And an extrovert would naturally say, well, Joe, what do you think your opinion is? <laughs> which is exactly the opposite of what you want to do in an introvert, but leaving space. And the the flip side of that on an introvert, oh, Jennifer, my heart is beating. I have an idea, but I'm nervous to say it. I have to be brave and state it. And maybe it doesn't have to happen in the meeting. Maybe it's a follow-up email. Maybe I have a partner in that meeting who I talked to before or after that meeting who can help advocate for this idea. Um, But it is changes on both sides to get the most out of each other. 
And mm. I think it's also kind of recognizing there are differences and appreciating those differences. I was in one training uh, where we separated the introverts and the extroverts. And so the introverts and extroverts as a group uh, individually had to ask questions of the extroverts and vice versa. And we, the introverts says, you know, we're going to ask the extroverts, why do you talk so much? And the introverts, <laughs> we're going to ask the extroverts, why don't you say anything? And it was so interesting, this very, you know, extreme um, perspective on each other's behaviors versus saying, wow, thank goodness an extrovert is there to help drive kind of the start of ideas and then hopefully pause. And thank goodness the introverts are there, are observing what's actually happening in this meeting, but then have to step up and state that and name that. That can be incredibly valuable on both sides. The other thing I just thought of is sometimes when we're when we're designing a, a workshop where we're hoping to get to a decision, we're you know, understanding, assessing, analyzing data, where we're coming up with insights and themes, and then we're looking at, you know, okay, what's the plan, you know, to move forward. Uh, one of the things that I've seen work really well, but I think it's been done not out of a sense of introversion, extroversion, and how to play to the strengths. It's more of an availability on the calendar thing, but to schedule rather than an eight-hour session, four hours on one day, four hours on the next. Mm. And you give people the overnight time to reflect. And I think you know, not only there's the obvious benefit to the introverts, but I think there's also the benefits to the extroverts who might have blurted out something on day one, and then they can rethink it and come back with maybe a more refined answer on day two. And hopefully the introverts are coming in with, you know, with their thoughts and their ability to provide the insights and, and everyone's making a decision based on better information. Absolutely. And I think um, there's also research on sleeping on something allows your brain to process it more. Um, mm. So certainly that's an advantage that introverts already know. Let me think about it. Uh, but to your point, extroverts also get the benefit of sleeping on it, allows your brain to process that information and maybe see it in a different light or add new value to it. So mm -hmm. I totally mm -hmm. agree with that. Um, I also think the mix of small and large groups can be very helpful. Um, and a group of even 10, 20 can be very intimidating to an introvert where three or four um, can be much more palatable. Yeah, that makes me think about, um, there's uh, liberating structures, which is a set of mm -hmm. group methods. They have an activity that's called one, I think it's one, two, four, all. And the idea mm. is, you know, here's here's a here's a situation or here's a challenge or here's a question and you spend time by yourself thinking, uh, coming up with questions, coming up with responses, and then you go into two people in that mm -hmm. dyad where you discuss it and come up with questions and then you get together with another dyad and you discuss it and then you bring, you know, bring mm. every, the, you know, the, the best of to the big group and offer it up as, hey, our group rather than one individual. Okay, we're getting we're getting geeky here with the uh, <laughs> with the group methods. Um, I want to get back to um, your coaching practice. And um, you're working with uh, female leaders who are introverts. Mm -hmm. And I want to I want to learn a little bit more about uh, the impact uh, that it has on your coaches when you're able to talk about introversion as a strength and help them um, uh, be able to lean into their introvert version as a strength. Mm. Yeah. So as I mentioned before, like just helping them understand there's a biological process happening that is driving some of their preferences. Um, I think is step number one. I think the next, and this is not just an introvert comment at all. It's about kind of finding that inner confidence um, and uh, being a, uh, confident to ask for what you want. I'll give you an example. I, I coach men. I also coach extroverts. Um, when I speak to an introverted woman um, about coaching and the opportunity to be coached, um, she will usually say, I uh, will all pay for it directly. And when I speak to a man, introverted or extroverted, he will always say, well, let me see if my company will pay for it. So I always tell the women, hey, you know what? Your colleagues are asking the company to pay for this coaching. Why don't you go ask? 
And that almost becomes the first test of, hey, am I willing to stand up for what I believe in? Um, and some people go ask and some people say, no, nope, I'm not ready for that. And that's fine. Um, and I've lost some clients because they've done that because the, the company says, oh, we have our own coaching program. I am totally fine with that because that person has taken a step to ask. And that's part of, of the challenge for an introvert, um, especially at mid-level where you don't have that experience um, and have built that confidence up. But to say, hey, I am who I am and I can ask uh, for things that I need and that, that I want and I can be brave. Um, and I think that's a key part of what um, uh, introverted women uh, can build is build that inner confidence. Um, and then once you get that inner confidence, then it's really about the external behaviors. You know, we've talked about a, a couple of these of how to deal with an extroverted environment, preparing um, for uh, a meeting or a decision or a presentation. Um, to your point, there are a lot of uh, overprepared uh, people uh, who are presenting if you're an introvert. But yet that gives you confidence and confidence to be able to answer questions, even if you're not prepared for it. So um, uh, being able to uh, interrupt someone in meetings to be able to get your point across. So there are certain behaviors you can learn once you have that connection to and everyone has it, that inner wisdom. But it's being able to bring that up sooner um, and being able to think about the behaviors you want to change without changing who you are, not changing your values, not changing your strengths, but bringing um, uh, to the table your unique leadership style. So you mentioned one of the first exercises you give introverts is to go ask for the company to pay for it. Is another exercise that you ask is to go inter interrupt an extrovert in a meeting this week? <laughs> That's, um, I don't state it exactly like that, uh, but I do say things like if they want to speak up in meetings, okay, well, how many times do you want to speak up in meetings this week? Um, and if they say, well, I'll do it one time. And I was like, mm, what about three times? And it's a negotiation, not so much to forcing them to do something, but mm -hmm. to put them outside of their comfort zone. And that's the way we're going to learn. Again, it doesn't mean, I think people uh, can hear that and say, oh, be more like an extrovert, which is a feedback I constantly got, not in so many words, but in terms of behaviors people were looking at uh, me for. And I realized, actually, I have no problem speaking up when I, it's something I'm passionate about. It's the more challenging when I don't know the topic, I'm not the expert, um, there are more senior leaders, there are situations where I myself kind of put a uh, tamp down whatever I wanted to say or my confidence or, or brave uh, uh, ability to be brave because of the external environment. But yet I'm the same person when I show up in places uh, where I am very passionate about, whether it's supporting women's leadership or supporting introverts. Um, you know, a lot of people, when I'm speaking with a lot of introverts, don't think I'm an introvert because I'm so passionate and I have so much to say uh, to them. But you put me in a room of a lot of extroverts and more senior to me, ooh, I shut up. <laughs> so, and I have to overcome those same things, the sweaty palms, I gotta speak up. Um, it, it's a learned behavior. You just mentioned that you got the advice, be more like an extrovert. Was that the worst career advice you've ever received? Oh. Um, and, and then I there's think... there's a moment where it's like, oh, if that's not it, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> because it's that just, just because that idea of like, you know, in, that that's the ignorance, the lack of information that the other person has, that introversion is a strength. Yes. Um, and it's a behavior that you can turn on or not. Yeah. And so I'm not sure if that was the worst career advice I got, um, but it is something that was maybe not explicitly stated to me, but implicitly stated to mm. me by the environment and who was successful in that environment. For me, it was just, hey, do great work and it'll be recognized. Well, that's not the way it happens. Like if people don't know you're doing great work, then it's not going to be recognized. Does that mean I need to be like an extrovert? Absolutely not. But there are ways that I can, again, modify my behavior, you know, be more visible is another um, you know, piece of feedback I used to get um, to enable others to see the great work and connect to your purpose. 
So um, as I mentioned, when I'm speaking with introverts, I can look like I'm actually quite extroverted because I am doing it in support of, of the other introverts as opposed to I'm doing it for myself. I'm not there to toot my own horn. I'm there to help others. So if you ask an introverted leader, if they you know, are able to speak up to get a promotion or a raise, oh no, I can't do that. But if they're asking for a promotion or a raise for their team, absolutely, they're all over that because they're, they're tied to connected to their purpose. It's not about the ego, it's about others, giving to others. What does it feel like when you're able to help an introvert um, realize that introversion is a strength and take on the behaviors that um, amplify that strength? What does that feel like mm. for you? It is amazing. Um, and it's interesting the way you even ask that question we may start with introversion, but as soon as people get over, oh, that's how my brain works, the, the actual language of introversion goes away. And mm -hmm. what we're looking for is finding your true leadership. So like any coaching anyone, it's finding what's true for you and how do you pursue that? And so watching someone kind of accept themselves for who they are and their preferences to then finding that internal confidence, to then taking action and recognizing, oh, I am in an extroverted world, so I do need to change my behaviors. Um, and so, but it's not changing who I am. So it's about, you know, modifying what you do. I'll give you an example. When I first started working, um, I was considered the ice queen because I didn't smile, I didn't say hello to people. I am so not the ice queen. And it was just because I was quiet. And so on my development plan, I said, I'm going to say hi to five people every morning. And so, of course, you know, what's the magic of five? I don't know. It was just a number. But it was hard at first. Oh, I got to say hi. Hi. I didn't have to talk to him. I just had to say hello. And then, of course, it got easy. Oh, it's pretty easy to say hello to five people. And then all of a sudden, people saw me as more warm and approachable. Did I change who I was? Absolutely not. But I actually became more of who I am by doing a slight behavior change. And so when I see that in a client and they realize, oh, it wasn't so hard to speak up in a meeting, doesn't mean you have to speak up and say, here's the most earth shattering you know, idea and we're gonna change your strategy because of this. It could be as simple as asking a question or saying, okay, so what are our next steps? That is all about speaking up and adding value with your voice. So it is incredibly rewarding for me to see my clients in their own way, not in the Jennifer way, in their own way, find the path that will make them successful. And then when they, when I see the joy of, hey, it wasn't so hard um, and the learning along the way, because there are obviously a lot of stumbles along the way, but the learning to realize oh, they would have never gotten there unless they figured out what worked for them. Um, and so what's so rewarding is for them to get there sooner than I got there. So what do you know to be true about leading with quiet confidence? Mm, that the world needs introverts and introverted leaders and that a quiet leader can be successful, absolutely can be successful. So. I know if you are true to yourself and you're open to different approaches and different ways to do things, as long as you are true to yourself and what you want to do, that you can be successful. What did you believe to be true early on about introversion that you've now learned is, is not true? <laughs> It is funny um, when we started talking about this question of superhero power and I came to this conclusion, wow, actually my superhero power is lead with quiet confidence, which first of all feels so weird to even call that a superhero power because I started out, as I mentioned, started out my career saying, oh, being quiet is bad. I have to mm. speak up more. Mm. I have to be something different than I am. So to finally come to this conclusion that, wow, there is a superpower here, it is pretty interesting where I took what I thought was a weakness and turned that into a superpower. Um, I think the point that 
made me realize this was I was in a diversity training and there was a role play going on. And there was a woman, a quiet woman who there was a role play of a decision being made. There were five or six people in the room and were an audience of about a hundred. And uh, the woman said an idea and no one paid attention. And a couple minutes later, a man says, oh, the same idea, but no one recognizes that the woman had said it. And the facilitator kind of pauses the role play and walks around the audience. And by the way, I'm here with my leadership team who are mostly white males. And there were a handful of uh, females in the audience. And she walks around the room and happens to stand right in front of me and says, it's about this point that someone in the audience starts to cry. <sighs> there I was. <sighs> and I started to cry. And I realized, wow, that was me so many years ago. How many times had that happened to me? And it was also a realization, wow, look how far I have come. And yeah. that was when I realized, wow, I've learned something. I am still who I am but I don't have as many of those situations as I used to. What have I done? It was an ref act of reflection. What have I done to be different? Um, and then that all came together when I decided to start coaching and I think connecting to introverted women to say, how can I expedite their learning about themselves and how to get that inner confidence sooner than it took me? So Jennifer, what's the impact that your superhero power has on others? Mm. So obviously in my coaching business, um, I focus on introverted women and, and have the impact there. Um, but a story I have from Microsoft is for my 50th birthday, um, I uh, got a strip of blue hair about this color blue. Um, and it was something I always wanted since like I was a teenager. And I realized just as I got older, like I just want to do this. And uh, that is something that's important to me. So of course, my first day, I was so nervous, walked in and uh, meeting with this senior leader. And he looks up at me and says, oh, you have different hair. I was like, oh, I was so nervous. And and uh, he totally accepted. He was fine. In fact, I ended up presenting um, to our CEO with my blue hair and no one peeped. Um, and I remember someone sent me a note, someone a couple levels below me and said, wow, if you sh can show up as your true self here at this company, mm -hmm. then I can too. So thank you for inspiring me. And I realized, wow, I did the blue hair for me, but what an impact it can have on others. Um, so it really made me think um, as I went into my coaching business and coaching introverts, how else can I have broader impact on others and, and that ripple effect? And so um, I am uh, launching a new workshop in uh, January, uh, the Lead with Quiet Confidence workshop for introverted women. Um, and we're going to go through some of the things we've talked about today. It's about kind of the education of who you are as an introvert, um, identifying what you want as your leadership style, um, getting into how do you find that inner wisdom, that inner mentor that's within you, and how do you kind of minimize the, the negative voices that we all have in our head, um, and then some very tangible techniques uh, to how to modify behavior uh, that is much more focused on uh, being successful in an extroverted world while not changing who you are, um, leveraging your strengths, keeping your values, and staying true to yourself. Um, so that's starting uh, Wednesday, January 17th. Um, and if you're interested in learning more, uh, just go to www.leadwithquietconfidence.com. You know, in, in the org development talent consulting world where there's a lot of introverts there, um, mm -hmm. but they have to force themselves to show up as extroverts, as they're facilitating meetings, as they're doing this type of uh, group method like work. Um, and it's, it's only recently that I've become aware of how, how much more they have to work um, at showing up uh, in these sessions um, than, than I do. Um, but it's, it's interesting, like, you know, when, when people are talking about going to, to happy hour afterwards, I'm, I'm right there with the other introverts be like, nope, nope, I gotta go home. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
And that's a great example that there are all sorts of varieties. You may be more uh, needing energy after a long day of workshops, um, or you may want to go out and, you know, have a few drinks. But, you know, for example, for me, like if I have to be invited to a cocktail party, I'm like, oh, do I have to go? Um, I'd much rather stay home with my book. But yet when I go, I have a great time. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's about being open to what your preferences are and then realizing where do you need to get your energy and making sure you're taking care of that. In fact, I think it was one of my, my introverted um, colleagues who talked about bringing their softest, coziest pair of pajamas whenever they traveled. So <laughs> they can leave that conference room, get to the uh, hotel room, put on those comfy pajamas and then order room service and just spend the night in their, their, uh, in, in their coziness. Absolutely. That sounds wonderful. That's what I'm going to do after this. <laughs> <laughs> so Jennifer, are you ready for the lightning round? Oh, yes. Do I win a prize? <laughs> yeah, of, of course. A, a, a free episode on the What Do You Know To Be True podcast. So fill in the blank. Leading with mm. quiet confidence is? Mm, is true to myself. So who in your life demonstrates leading with quiet confidence for you? It's not really in my life, but I would say Gandhi is an inspiration. Mm. He's a introvert, but passionate and did not stop him from impacting the world. Yeah, there's something I've noticed about um, introverts that when something is wrong, when something is not following the right process, when people are taking advantage of other people, that there's a strength that comes up straight from the heart, mm. from the soul. Um, and, and, and I think Gandhi's a good example of that. Mm. Is there a practice or routine that helps you grow, nurture, or renew your ability to lead with quiet confidence? It's really about knowing your inner wisdom and your inner mentor. So I go and visit. In fact, before I went on this podcast, I visited my inner mentor and she said, it's just a conversation and you're not doing it for yourself, but you're doing it for all the other introverts. Mm -hmm. And so that is wisdom that came from me, but really channeled through my inner mentor. Does your inner mentor have a strip of blue hair? Uh, not, no, she's older and she has this really cool asymmetric gray mm. haircut. <laughs> Love that. Love that. I'm just your, your story of the strip of blue hair, I think, is a, is a great example of leading um, and, and having an impact on others. Is there a book or movie that you recently consumed that you would recommend that has leading with quiet confidence as a theme? Oh, uh, two books. I love uh, Susan Cain's Quiet. It is a highly researched book on introversion. And so you'll get a lot of understanding. There are introverted animals, even sunfish. So mm -hmm. I think that's in the first chapter. And the second, um, I went through uh, the uh, facilitator's training on Playing Big by Tara Moore. Um, she is the one that brought um, from the uh, CTI training, Coaching Training Institute, the Inner Mentor, um, which I use a lot in my coaching business and will do in the Lead with Quiet Confidence um, workshop that is targeted to women, not necessarily introverted women, but women uh, helping them play bigger. What is one thing that gets in your way of leading with quiet confidence? Oh, myself, myself, myself. So, I said I said only one. You listed okay, three. Just, just Pick one. one. Myself. Okay. <laughs> um, even just coming to this podcast, I love you, Roger. You're amazing to mm. talk to. So easy to talk to, but I was so nervous. And so this idea of having confidence, I'm just going to have a conversation about something I'm super passionate about is, is just checking in with myself and connecting to kind of my purpose and the why and getting over all those negative feelings. I have to admit, when I started introducing the segment as the lightning round, realizing, oh, this introverts probably hate this. <laughs> yes. I'm yes. sorry. That's okay. <laughs> okay, so this is no longer the lightning round. This is the, let's take a moment and, and pause. Okay. <laughs> what word or phrase describes 
what leading with quiet confidence feels like when it's had an impact? Two words I can't probably can't use: confident and impact. I think impact um, <laughs> yeah. is is probably the salient point. Is it's not just thoughts in your mind that are happening. It is that ability to get that out to the world, whether it's stating it or taking action on it, that does have impact. And I think um, the sad case of being in an extroverted world is there is a lot of impact that is lost because introverts are not taking action, not speaking up. There's not a space for them to be who they are. And so I think the ability to lead with quiet confidence, both for introverts and extroverts, allow everyone to have impact. And, and, and I'm sorry, were you saying that that's a belief that introverts have or that that's, that is a reality out there about? I think in many cases, it's a reality if mm. introverts are not sharing their perspective because of all the things that are going on in one's head. Mm. Like, mm. oh, I can't say that. If someone already said that, it's not of value. It's off point. It's, you know, it's not relevant. When in fact, you'll hear an introvert say, well, I don't know if this is relevant. And they'll say some point and it's nails, nails the point that needs to be made. Um, and so that ability for all of us to share our perspectives, um, uh, I think is, is going to have a much bigger impact on the world. If a listener wanted to ask you a question or follow up with you, where do you want to point them to? Uh, go to my website, uh, www.leadwithquietconfidence.com. Wonderful. Well, Jennifer, it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. I think your examples and how you lead with confidence um, is probably really impactful for, for the women that you coach, probably really impactful for the men that you coach as well to get a greater sense of you know, the powers of introverts and extroverts and the behaviors that help them um, both have a big impact. Um, but I, I imagine there's, you know, a lot of people that get to see you and your leadership style, whether it's with a strip of blue hair or not. Um, <laughs> and it, it has a really long lasting impact and in, in creating space for them to step mm -hmm. into their strength. So thank you for sharing all of that goodness with us. This has been, it's been a pleasure to have this conversation and to learn from you today. Yes, thank you so much, Roger, for doing this for the world. Mm. Well, my audience isn't that big yet, but you know. <laughs> yet. I, I have confidence that it'll, it'll yes. get bigger for sure. <laughs> thank you, Jennifer. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. I appreciate the level of clarity and deep and sincere awareness that Jennifer brought to the conversation. And I'm so grateful that she chose to share her perspectives and her superhero power with us today. I love her story of how she became aware of her limiting beliefs around introversion and learned how to live into how her brain works and lead in an authentic way for her. I also love how she has made a pivot in her career to focus on helping others with her superhero power and enable others to lead with quiet confidence. I'm inspired by the level of conviction and the strength of her passion that she brings to this endeavor. And it's not just passion, it's power and it's purposeful. And it's such a great example of the types of people I love to learn from and spend time with. Jennifer, thank you for bringing it today. Okay, I'm gonna say it loud for the extroverts in the back and I'm gonna say it calmly for the introverts in the front better understanding of how people process information, engage in discussions, and create at their best is critical for generating better ideas, for making better decisions, and to achieve higher performance. So whether you're working on yourself, if you're coaching or managing a team, or if you're leading an organization, knowing your strengths and your style is critical to your success and for all those around you. A key learning or relearning today is being able to discern the styles of others in order to create an environment that is inclusive for all styles to engage in the work. And that's critical for being an effective leader. Unless your style is being an asshole, then sorry, not sorry, there really should be no room 
in any organization for that style. This leads me to reflect on a few things that I encourage you to reflect on as well. When using my superhero power, is there an opportunity to change my approach to be more inclusive for both the introverted and extroverted styles in the room? And as a not so subtle hint to my extroverted friends, the second question may be more for us than for the introverts. How will I know when my superhero power has made a meaningful impact on both the introverts and the extroverts? Okay, if you like this episode, please do me a favor and share the episode with one other person. Thank you for doing that. What Do You Know To Be True is a Three Blue Pens production. I'm your host, Roger Kastner. We are recording on the ancestral lands of the Duwamish and Suquamish people. To discover the ancestral lands of the indigenous people whose lands you are on, go to native-lands.ca. Okay, be well, my friends. No harmonica playing, thank goodness. <laughs> oh, I forgot to ask. Did you did you bring yours? <laughs> Do, do you have like a do you have like a saxophone or a trumpet yeah. nearby just in like, case? I cannot live up to that. So. That that dude's an incredible guy. Um, yeah, I've totally forgotten your question now. <laughs> it, it, it happens, and I heard this from a yoga teacher, and I thought it was really aggressive, but I kind of liked it. It's our adversaries are eighty percent water, and we are made of stardust. And I didn't like the whole, I think she actually said oh. enemies. Enemies are 80% water. And it's like, namaste. Like, like that doesn't, <laughs> I'm doesn't, not sure I even understand that. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but I love the the part like, hey, yeah, we're stardust. Like, we, we yeah. got this. Yeah. I think I need to start bringing Kleenex to this. Because uh, <laughs> so there's some dust in here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>